Well, good morning and welcome to Grace. We're so privileged to have you here worshiping with us this morning. A um, couple quick announcements. Uh, first, if you're a first-time vis- visitor, we'd love to have you complete the Grace Connect card in the pew rack in front of you and drop it into the uh, offertory plate or, or the boxes at the back of the sanctuary on your way out. We'd love to have your contact information so we can communicate all the events going on at the church. Uh, speaking of events, we have the picnic in two weeks, uh, June 4, and you should have received through um, Lisa Wilson uh, a, uh, a uh, invitation to either say you're going to come or to provide a dessert. So if you haven't got one of those, let me know and we'll make sure you get that. But please mark uh, Sunday right after the service, June 4, uh, we'll be eating in the fellowship hall. Um, I'd like to ask Dr. Jacobs to come up at this moment. He's got uh, some words he would like to say and then introduce some new members. Good morning, church. I remember back in June of 2000, when R.C. Sproul spoke at a memorial service for James Montgomery Boyce, who at the time had served as pastor for over 30 years at 10th Presbyterian in Philadelphia. And uh, R.C. said something like this, that sometimes it is that God calls home his spokesman before his judgment or action takes place in this world. And I thought it was a profound thing to say. Uh, This week has been a unique time of great loss to the church at large and particularly to our denomination, the PCA. In the same week, God called home two of our heroes, two great spokesmen of God, Tim Keller, professor, best-selling author, founder of Redeemer Presbyterian in Manhattan, New York, as well as Harry Reeder, longtime pastor of Briarwood Presbyterian in Birmingham, Alabama. In fact, 43 years ago, Harry Reeder was at Deb and I's wedding, dear friend. And uh, before I do anything else, I think it'd be appropriate if we took a moment and bowed our heads and hearts in a word of prayer. Can we do that? Our God and our Father, we are so reminded that life is but a vapor. And uh, our hearts go out to both the Keller family and Reeder family, Father, as well as their churches, and all of those whom they have affected and influenced for so many years. We just uh, ask you, God, that you would raise up a new generation of men who would be those kind of men, Um, solid, bold, reformed, biblical heroes in this lost, crazy, and needy world. And so we pray for these families, Lord. We pray for their respective ministries. And uh, we thank you, Father, for the work they have done and the influences that they have had. And uh, we, uh, as a church, um, we thank you. And we commend them to your care. And uh, we look forward, Lord, to one day in eternity to come being able to sit around and share our war stories. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. I'd like to invite Mike and Carol Overton to join me on the platform. Mike and Carol have been coming to Grace for some time and have met with Deb and I in the session, and now we're coming as members before you today, and it's great to have you both. It's a blessing. Uh, Mike and Carol, do you acknowledge yourselves to be sinners in the sight of God, justly deserving his displeasure, and without hope except for his sovereign mercy? And Mike and Carol, do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of sinners, and do you receive and rest upon him alone for salvation, as he is offered in the gospel? And do you now resolve and promise in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit, that you will endeavor to live as becomes followers of Christ. And do you promise to support this church and its worship and work to the best of your ability? 
and you submit yourselves to the government and discipline of the church and promise to study its purity and its peace. Let's pray. Again, our God and our Father, we're grateful for your work in people's lives and as, as a session, as a body of elders, what a joy it is to hear time and time again how you move in people's lives, calling them and drawing them to yourself. We thank you for Mike's testimony and Carol's testimony. It is a great joy, Father, to have them as a part of this small part of your body. And uh, we pray, Father, that uh, as they will be a great blessing to grace, we pray that as a church we might be a great blessing to them as well. Uh, we commit them to your care. And again, all God's people said, amen. God bless you both. And I will make note, there's a dear friend over here, Steve and Michelle Kreloff. Uh, he's been pastor, I don't know, decades at Lakeside Community Chapel. How many decades? 42 years. 42 years. That's a long time. And uh, Steve knows so many people that he barely remembers me, but we actually started in seminary together. And uh, Paul Enns and all of those guys, uh, what a great joy to have you. They've been through a difficult time as a family, but we've been praying as a church for you, brother. You've been on our prayer list, and let's give a hand. Can we welcome the Kreloffs to our church this morning? God bless you both. Our Old Testament scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 3, and I'm going to read 7 through 15. You can find and follow along with me the text on the front page of our worship folder. And the Lord said, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their outcry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their sufferings. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Havite, and the Jebusite. And now, behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. And now come, and I will send you to Pharaoh, so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Assuredly, I will be with you. And this shall be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of the land of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. Then Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel. And I will say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, this is what you shall say to the sons of Israel. I am has sent me to you. God furthermore said to Moses, this is what you shall say to the sons of Israel. The Lord, the God of your fathers the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. My name is forever, and this is the name for all generations to use to call upon me. Please stand as we begin our service with a call to worship. Hallelujah. Praise God in the temple in the highest heavens. Praise, praise God's mighty deeds and noble majesty. All that is alive, praise. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah.
We now come to the time of our service where we profess the truth of our faith. The Apostles' Creed, it begins with God and creation, then moves to the incarnation, the death and the resurrection of Jesus, as well as looking forward to his return. And then it concludes by telling the story of the Spirit's involvement in our lives today, speaking through the Bible, gathering of the church, reassuring the guilty, and filling us with hope. So now let us profess together what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated. We now come to that time in our service of our confession of sin. And Jesus tells us that we cannot come before God unless we are first honest with ourselves about who we are, about the mistakes that we make, and about how well or poorly we care for others. And it's in this spirit, let us offer our prayers and our confessions to God. Eternal God, we confess that often we have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. 
and we have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us from joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Jesus gives us, through David, King David, an assurance that our prayers are answered. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse us, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for us, for those who fear him, as far as the east is from the west. So far has he removed our transgressions from us. And then, of course, Jesus taught us to pray this prayer that we pray weekly. So let's recite that beautiful prayer, our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning again. As a church, we've been studying through the Gospel of Mark. I want to encourage you to 
turn to Mark chapter 12, where we'll be looking at verses 18 and following this morning. And as you're doing so, I want to remind you that as we introduced Mark some time ago, quite a bit of time ago, that I suggest to you that um, Mark was written as an oral text. Uh, Liberal scholars have suggested that Mark was short of information. They talk about key source and marking and priority and all that. But scholars, very fine scholars, have suggested that Mark was really written to an ancient Near Eastern world where the literacy rate was quite low, written to be a, a text that's read out loud. And when we introduced Mark, we pointed out some of the unique features about Mark's gospel. But one of them is that Mark takes place only in three stages, and they are geographic stages. His time around the Galilee moves to the second phase, him moving from the Galilee towards Jerusalem, and then finally Jesus in Jerusalem, and that's where we are right now in our text. Jesus has reached Jerusalem. It is the final stage, and uh, Jesus will be in Jerusalem until the gospel of Mark closes. And one of the things, among other things, that takes place in Jerusalem is confrontations confrontations between Jesus and the leadership, spiritual, religious leadership in Jerusalem. And in our text today, Jesus is in the middle of what I'll call a barrage of confrontation. They're coming at him one after the other after the other. And in verse 18, we find the next barrage takes place with the Sadducees. So if you are with me in Mark 12, beginning at verse 18, would you join as we stand together for the reading of God's holy, inerrant, and infallible word? Beginning at verse 18, some Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus and began questioning him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves behind a wife and leaves no child, his brother should marry the wife and raise up children to his brother. There were seven brothers. The first took a wife and died, leaving no children. The second one married her, died, leaving no children. The third likewise, and so all seven left no children. Last of all, the woman died also. In the resurrection, when they rise again, which one's wife will she be? For all seven had married her. And Jesus said to them, Is this not the reason you are mistaken, that you do not understand the scriptures, nor the power of God. For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. Regarding the fact that the dead rise again, have you not read in the book of Moses, in in the passage about the burning bush, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And you are greatly mistaken." Let's pray. Again, our God and our Father, we're grateful for this time uh, to hear from you. We have spoken to you through our songs and hymns, our prayers and confessions. And now, Lord, we pause to listen. We pray that you would give us those ears to hear and eyes to see. May our hearts be like the parable of Jesus, a field in which hardness has been removed, along with thorn and thistle and stoniness. May we have a fertile ground. May our hearts be ready to receive the seed, which is the word of God today. We do pray for the one who preaches his sins or many. Hide him in the shadow of our Savior, that we might see him. And Father, we would ask that this morning we would not only be challenged, but more importantly, changed not just confronted by your truth, but conformed to the image of our Savior. And we ask these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Please be seated. At first glance, in the midst of these confrontations, this encounter appears to be about things like the resurrection, the afterlife, maybe even marriage, maybe even angels, And it is. But what we could easily miss in this encounter is that this encounter is also very much about the word of God. You'll notice verse 24, Jesus said to them, this is not the reason that you are mistaken, that you do not understand the scriptures. You'll see it in verse 26 again. 
But regarding the fact that the dead rise again, have you not read in the book of Moses? The scriptures. Scriptures. Including other theological truths that we'll touch on this morning, this text is telling us something about how Jesus viewed the scriptures. I don't know if you have ever heard this phrase, but allow me to introduce it to you. It is the phrase, the canon of scripture. The canon of scripture. It refers to the specific books that make up our Bible. The canon of scripture. Years and years ago, I bought a copy of F.F. Bruce's The Canon of Scripture. That's the title of the book written by Bruce. And I returned to it, and in his introduction, F.F. Bruce writes this. When we speak of the canon of scripture, the word canon has a simple meaning. It means the list of books contained in the scripture. The list of books recognized as worthy to be included in the sacred writings of a worshiping community. In a Christian context, we might define the word as the list of writings acknowledged by the church as documents of divine revelation. In this sense, the word appears to have first been used by Athanasius, Bishop of Alexandria, in his letter circulated in A.D. 367. The word canon has come into our language through the Latin, through the Greek. In the Greek, the word simply meant rod, especially a straight rod used as a rule. From this usage comes other meanings by which the word commonly bears in the English the idea of being a rule or a standard. Bruce goes on, for example, Thomas Aquinas said that the canonical scripture, that is the books that the canon makes up, is alone the rule for faith and practice. So the canon of scripture. From our theological perspective, the Westminster Confession of Faith, after listing all 66 books of both Old and New Testament, adds this. It says, all of which are given by inspiration of God to be the rule of faith and life. These words affirm the status of our scriptures as a canon or standard by which all Christian teaching and action must be regulated. The canon of scripture means the list of books that are accepted by the people of God as the sacred writings. What does it have to do with the text? Well, I'm going to suggest to you that what Jesus is dealing with is he's dealing with the issue of the canon of scripture. You'll notice verse 18, that's where we began. Some Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to Jesus and began questioning him, saying, Who are these people? Who are the Sadducees? <clears throat> the Sadducees were ostensibly the original liberals. <laughs> they didn't accept the entire canon of scripture. And the parts that they accepted, they accepted it only in terms of demythologizing it. The Sadducees only accepted the first five books of the Old Testament called the books of Moses or the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. But even in their handling of those five books, they rejected anything in them that suggested the supernatural. While it may not be immediately recognized, many of Jesus' conflicts throughout the gospel as Jesus deals with Israel's religious leadership really were controversies that were rooted in the issue of the canon of Scripture. Jesus dealt with those who subtracted from the canon, i.e. the Sadducees in our own text. And then also those who added to the canon of Scripture, the Pharisees, who included as authoritative the teachings of men, rabbinical traditions, and so forth. For instance, the Pharisees added to the canon of Scripture... They created hundreds and hundreds of laws that aren't anywhere in the word of God. Jesus would say to those, you have heard it said, but I say to you. And then you have the, the Sadducees who subtracted from the canon of scripture, dismissed most of the Old Testament, and certainly any notion of the supernatural. Both groups, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, had really an aberrant or distorted understanding of the things of God because of their subtraction or addition to the canon of Scripture. Both the Pharisees and the Sadducees in different ways rejected the truth of 2 Timothy 3.16, which says what? All Scripture is inspired by God. 
In the 1950s, one of the great attacks upon the word of God came from Germany. Primarily, the liberal scholar named Rudolf Bultmann. Bultmann believed that the Bible was a mythological work. He believed that there were, in fact, some claims and there was some sort of message in the Bible, but that it was all encased in mythology. Bultmann's famous quote, we cannot use electric lights and radios in an event of illness, avail ourselves of modern medical and clinical means, and at the same time, believe in the spirit and wonder world of the New Testament, end quote. That is from his New Testament and mythology and other basic writings. Bultmann took all the supernatural accounts in scripture, dismissed them all, and interpreted them all in a way that advanced his own existential philosophy. Bultmann's ideas were not original. The Sadducees were 2,000 years before Bultmann. And for the Sadducees, they said there is no supernatural, there is no resurrection, there are no angels, no miracles, no afterlife, no heaven, no hell, even though many of these things appear in the books of Moses, the first five books. They were literally materialist liberals at the time. And for the Sadducees, after death came the Old Testament, their idea of Old Testament Sheol, it was the final resting place. And for them, any idea of a future after this life was understood to only concern, uh, consist of uh, the reputation you left behind and maybe the posterity, your children and grandchildren that you left behind. They did I have an idea of God resurrecting Israel at certain times when she fell into dire situations. The Sadducees were... A nihilist. When you're done, you're done, and it's over. Does the idea of the resurrection appear in the Old Testament? Yes, it does. For instance, Job 19, 25 and following, as for me, Job says, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will take a stand on the earth, even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I will see God, whom I myself shall behold, and whom my eyes will see, and not another. Even after I die, I will see God in my flesh, Job says. Psalm 49, 15, but God will redeem my soul from the power of Sheol, and he will receive me. He'll redeem me from death. Psalm 73, nevertheless, I am continually before you. You have taken hold of my right hand. With your counsel, you will guide me, and afterward, you will receive me to glory. Whom do I have in heaven but you, the psalm says. Daniel 12, many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake these to everlasting life, but to others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. To those who have insight, they will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. And those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. In fact, the book of Daniel ends with this, but as for you, the angel says, go your way, Daniel, to the end, and then you will enter into rest, listen, and rise again for your allotted portion at the end of the age. Job points to resurrection. The Psalms point to resurrection. Daniel points to resurrection. But the problem for the Sadducees was that Job, Psalms, Daniel weren't part of the Pentateuch. Genesis 22 Abraham and Isaac, and it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to Abraham, Abraham, here I am. He said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. He split wood for a burnt offering and rose and went to the place which God had told him. And on the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. And as he leaves with everything he needs, the son and the, and the instrument of sacrifice, Abraham says to the young men with him, stay here with the donkey. And I and the lad will go over there and we will worship and we will return to you. The writer of Hebrews says this, Hebrews 11, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, who had received the promises, offering up his only begotten son. It was said of him, in Isaac, your descendant shall be called. And he, Abraham, considered that God is able to raise people even 
from the dead. Unlike the Sadducees, Abraham believed in the supernatural. He believed in resurrection. And what is the difference between Abraham and the Sadducees? One word, faith. Abraham had faith in God, had faith in God's word, had faith in the power of God. And the difference between Jesus and the Sadducees, like Abraham, faith. Jesus, in this text, is demonstrating his faith in God's word. The entire canon of scripture, no additions and no subtractions. That's my first point, Jesus in the canon of scripture. A second point, Jesus in the foolishness of men. Man can, men be foolish. Notice verse 19 and following. Teacher, Moses wrote us that if a man's brother dies and leaves behind a wife and leaves no child, his brother shall marry the wife, raise up children to his brother. Now comes the story, verse 20, there were seven brothers. And the first took a wife, died, leaving no child. Second one married her, died, leaving no child. Third, likewise, and so all seven left no children. Last of all, the woman dies also. In the resurrection, when they rise again, which one's wife will she be for all seven had married her. There's the question. And it is, frankly, a ridiculous question. And by the way, they, they really think they've got Jesus. With, this is a gotcha question. This question involves God's Old Testament law that's called leveret marriage. It's in the Old Covenant. It's not in the New Covenant. As Christians, we don't practice leveret marriage. But in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, in order to preserve the continuation of a family line, in order to preserve a man's name, in order to provide a material inheritance and so forth, um, leveret marriage was practice. At Deuteronomy 25 speaks of it. It says, when brothers live together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the deceased shall not be married outside the family to a strange man. Her husband's brother shall go in into her and take her to himself as wife and perform the duties of a husband's brother to her. And it shall be that the firstborn whom she bears shall assume the name of his dead brother so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. That's what they're referring to. And again, this isn't part of the new covenant. So the Sadducees use this question, question, the question in order to address the resurrection. Seven brothers, one marries this woman, then dies, next brother marries her, also dies, next one marries her, dies, fourth one marries her, dies, fifth one marries her and dies, sixth one marries her and dies. And if I didn't know where there was going to me personally, the point of the story must be, is the seventh brother really dumb enough to marry her, amen? I mean, this gal is the original black widow. <laughs> so that's their question. That's their question. And this question has become part of their arsenal. This is a Sadducee arsenal defensive question in order to defend and hold up their no resurrection arguments. And obviously, if they come with <clears throat> this question to the undefeated Jesus... Their experience says that this question is a no-lose proposition. It's silenced our op opponents in the past, and so they come to Jesus with their undefeated go-to question. And that's my second point, Jesus in the foolishness of men. Um, it comes in all shapes and sizes, doesn't it? My last two points really come from Jesus' two-part response. If you look at verse 24, here's its two-part response. Jesus said to them, is this not the reason you are mistaken? Number one, that you do not understand the scriptures. And number two, nor the power of God. So my last two points, first, Jesus in the canon, Jesus and foolish men. Number three, Jesus and understanding the scripture and Jesus understanding uh, the power of God. So first, Jesus in understanding the scripture. Notice verse 24 and 25 again. 
And Jesus said to them, is this not the reason you're mistaken, that you do not understand the scriptures nor the power of God? For when they raise from the dead, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. Now, as you look at this, in this first part of his response, Jesus does something very interesting. And that is, he doesn't refer to the resurrection as an event. Rather, he refers to the resurrection in terms of what comes after the resurrection. The life that is post-resurrection. The life that comes after the resurrection. Doesn't talk about the resurrection event, but Jesus speaks of the life, this heavenly, eternal, everlasting life. And on the front end, Jesus is pointing out that the Bible doesn't describe heavenly life as a simple continuation of earthly life, as sort of a sequel to earthly life, or a perpetuation of earthly life, but rather, heavenly life will be something very different. And one of the main differences in heaven isn't really primarily about marriage, it's really primarily about procreation. In their silly question, you'll notice in verse 20, 21, and 22, it's not only the brothers marrying this gal, but it's them marrying this gal and dying and leaving behind no children. It's really more about procreation than it is about marriage or the institution. It's really about procreation. The story is really no procreation. That's why she moves from brother to brother to brother. At any point, if one of them would have produced for them, her an heir, then the marriage sequence ends. But it didn't provide an heir. It's about pro pro uh, procreation. And primarily what Jesus is saying is that in this world, we have to procreate. Why? It's real simple. Death. Death. Uh, if we didn't procreate as a human strain in several generations, the world would be absent of human beings. That's all it would take. And sociologists are watching this take place in countries that either one, outlaw more than a few children or children at all, and two, the places where marriage and giving birth has become, you know, uncool, unhip, and we're seeing these places where populations are falling, and there's concern. Procreation must exist on earth because of death, but procreation will not exist in heaven because in heaven there is, get this, no death. In the past, I've looked at this text, and there's a part of it that makes me a little bit sad because I so truly love my wife. I don't ever want not to be married to her. And I've told her, if you ever leave me, I'm coming with you. <laughs> and I mean it. But I want you to notice something I think interesting about verse 25. At least it's provoking to me. Look at it carefully. For when they rise from the dead, Jesus said, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. You'll notice, if you notice this carefully, that Jesus doesn't say, and I believe it's purposeful, that he doesn't say there won't be marriage, per se. But rather, exactly what he says is that there won't be weddings. There'll be no marrying, i.e. brides and grooms, and no giving in marriage, i.e. father and mother-in-laws, all of that. That's specifically what he says. There'll be no marriage, given in marriage, and no uh, marrying. And maybe, just maybe, and I'm stretching this, I get it, but maybe what Jesus is saying is, well, there will not be weddings, nor uh, will there be marriages taking place, ceremonies, and that there's certainly no need for procreation? Maybe there is at some place in heaven, some room in heaven, where the covenant love of two people who have become one on earth is at least recognized. I sure hope so. 
Regardless, I believe that if that could be the case, that in our glorified state, in heaven, I will have an opportunity to love my wife greater, more deeply, more godly, more perfectly than I ever have in this lifetime. And I don't know about your world or your life, but I know one thing for certain, that God has used my wife in ways that I will never forget. And throughout eternity in heaven, I know that she is one of the main instruments that God used in my life in order for me to be there in the first place. But remember, the original question is about levirate marriage, a woman moving from brother to brother in marriage, given in marriage, given in marriage, so forth, until hoping that she will give birth to a son, a son who keeps the original husband's name alive, becomes heir, becomes a posterity. But in heaven, there will be no need for procreation. Why? And there's no death in heaven. You'll be like the angels. We don't know a lot about the creation of angels. We can assume some things. We can assume that angels were created before man was created. Job speaks of the angels shouting for joy, the B'nai Elohim shouting for joy as God created the heavens and the earth. Watching that all take place, they celebrated and worshiped God. We don't know a lot, but we do know this, that when God created the angels, he did so before he created man, and whatever the angelic, original angelic population was at their creation, it hasn't changed at all. No angels have died. No new angels have been born. It's the same original angelic population. Now, I know some of you grandparents look at that little grandbaby and go, isn't that an angel? In your eyes, but God's not adding angels to the angelic population. Everybody say amen. So in other words, we will be like the angels. And the emphasis is on procreation, I believe. Again, the two final points come from Jesus. You are mistaken, number one, not understanding the scriptures. But two, not understanding the power of God. Notice with me, if you would, verse 26 and 27. But regarding the fact that the dead rise again, have you not read in the book of Moses in the passage about the burning bush how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And Jesus concludes, you are greatly, greatly mistaken. Now what Jesus says here in response is really absolutely incredible. First, in grace, he concedes to the Sadducees' commitment, as it were, in the Pentateuch, in those first five books. He doesn't go to the Psalms. He doesn't go to Job. He doesn't go to Daniel. He concedes. He says, okay, if you believe the first five books, let me, let me defend the resurrection in those first five books. <coughs> Where does he turn? He turns to the second book of the book of Moses, the book of Exodus. And I want you to turn there with me, if you would, Exodus chapter 3. Beginning in verse 1, Exodus 3, 1. Now Moses was pastoring the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Median, and he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. That would later be identified as Sinai. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. Then he said, do not come near, remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said also, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. When God and Moses met, as Moses encounters God in this burning bush, God initiates 
introduction. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. God's reference to himself as the God of the patriarchs appears all through the Old Testament. Often, either the God of Abraham, or elsewhere, the God of Isaac, or elsewhere, the God of Jacob, or many places, the God of all three, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's very common throughout the entirety of the Old Testament. What is not so common is Jesus' interpretation of what that title means. Jesus' inference as to the meaning of that title really centers on the key, which is the personal pronoun anohi, which means I am, as opposed to I was. That is to say that 2,000 years plus or minus after Abraham died, 2,000 years plus or minus after Isaac died, 2,000 years plus or minus after Jacob died, God says to Moses, I am still their God. And Jesus' point to the Sadducees is that the covenant that God established with the patriarchs, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, didn't terminate with their death, with their natural physical death. As one commentator writes, quote, to be associated with the living God is to be taken beyond the temporary life of earth into a relationship, I love this, which lasts as long as God lasts, end quote. And Jesus is saying the assurance of the resurrection can't be diminished or jettisoned because of your silly little story. But the assurance of resurrection finds a certainty in the nature of our ever-living, ever-faithful, eternal, covenant-making God himself. You only yield to the first five books, Jesus says, fine. I'll show you resurrection in the third chapter, the second book of the Bible, resurrection. It's who God is. In fact, I'd even suggest that I can take you someplace even earlier than Exodus 3. In fact, I'd like you to look with me at Genesis 1. It's at the beginning, if you can't find it. It's up front. Notice verse 11. Then God said, let the earth sprout vegetations. Notice, plants yielding what? Seed. And fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit after their own kind with seed in them. And it was so. Verse 12, and the earth brought forth vegetation, plants, here it is again, yielding seed after their kind, trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind. And God saw that it was good, and don't miss verse 13, and there was evening and there was morning, what's it say? A third day. All you got to do is look out that window, you know what you see? You see resurrection. Everything you behold out there that is green once was dead. Dead. And God performed this miracle into creation and did so purposely millennia before the birth of Christ and the resurrection of Christ and chose to do so of all times on the third day. In fact, if you get really, really old seeds, let's call them good and dead, they call them heirloom, and they charge a fortune for them. <laughs> the third day. Third day. Don't leave Genesis 1. In the late 1800s, a man who was a polymath. Polymath refers to a person who is advanced in studies, who applies multiple academic disciplines together, this man in the 1800s, as polymath, coined the phrase, a familiar phrase that we usually misquote and miscredit. He coined the phrase, survival of the fittest. 
didn't come from Darwin. It came from one of Darwin's contemporaries, a man by the name of Herbert Spencer. Spencer, who was a philosopher, psychologist, biologist, sociologist, and anthropologist, determined in his scientific work that existence and life in this universe demanded that the universe include the following things. Ready? Time, force, motion, space, and matter. For there to be existence, for there to be life, the universe had to include time, force, motion, space, and matter. Notice Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, time. God, force, created, motion, the heavens, space, and the earth, matter. In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth, and in the beginning, God engaged in everything necessary for there to be life and existence, time, force, motion, space, and matter. God, from his first revelation in the first verse of the first book, is a God about life. Back in our text, verse 27, Jesus concludes about God that he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. I just thought about this for a little bit. You know what? Life is what God is all about. He's all about life. God is about life. Christ is about life. The Spirit is about life. The Gospels are about life. Our world thinks it's living. Man, we're living. But the truth of the matter is, it's really only Christians that are living. The rest of the world isn't living. The truth is, the rest of the world is dying. The scriptures, just think about this. The scriptures speak of our God as, listen to this, the living God. Who said in the beginning, let the water swarm with living creatures. The earth be filled with living creatures. The sky be filled with living creatures. It is the same living God who breathed life into the nostrils of man. And it says that he, Adam, became a living being. Life. And what did God do? In that first arboreal temple called the Garden of Eden, God set in the middle of that garden the tree of what? Life. Life. Adam, name your wife. He names her Eve because she was the mother of all the living. Subsequent to the creation comes the laws of God. And what did the laws of God do? They protected life. And as believers, you know what we need to do? We need to do everything we possibly can do to protect life. The Gospels then come, and John says that when Jesus came to earth, in him was, of all things, yes, life. He is called the Prince of Life. He said of himself, I am the living water, I am the bread of life. 2 Timothy tells us the appearing of our Lord and Savior who abolished death and brought life. Jesus said that from your innermost being shall flow rivers of living water, life, vitality, life. Our our Bible that we started talking about, what's it called? The word of life. The scripture says of itself that God's word is living and active. Jesus, here's the call, was then and it is still this very moment, Jesus' call to all of us, come to me that you may have life. Paul would say the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Do you realize that if you're a Christian this morning, your name has been written in the Lamb's book of life. Life. 1 John 5, 2. 
He who has the Son has life, but he who does not have the Son does not have life. The Bible speaks of things like the newness of life, eternal life, everlasting life, abundant life. Not only does Mark have three movements, but you could actually say that the whole of God's word has three movements, three acts. Act one, God gives life. Act two, man and sin brings death. And act three, Jesus conquers death and offers life again. Life. It's good Presbyterians. Let me end with this and we'll pray. What does Ephesians 2 tell us? That you were, ready? Dead in your trespasses and sin. You were dead. Do you remember being dead in your trespasses and sins? I sure do. You know what? Something that is dead is inert. It can't respond. It can't respond. The stimuli, nothing. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. In verse 4, but God, he's the exception. A living God. Because of his rich mercy, because of his great love, with which he loved us, even when we were dead, has made us, you want to guess, alive. Together with Christ, for by grace you are saved. Question. What makes a Christian a Christian? God makes a Christian a Christian. God takes the dead, the inert, and breathes into us life. Life. He makes us alive. Alive. I would ask you to bow your heads and hearts with me in a word of prayer. Father, first of all, we want to thank you for life for life, not just physical life, but spiritual life, the newness of life, the promise of eternal everlasting life, the abundant life in Christ. Father, we thank you again also, so much so, uh, that there is life after life, that you are the God of the living. And that your covenant love, commitment, promise to us will last as long as you last, which is everlasting, right? We're so thankful that you have made a way. You have made a way to conquer the law of sin and death by your grace through our Lord Jesus Christ. But Father, my heart also hurts for someone here today or listening from a distance who might, may not have life, who really isn't living, but ultimately is only dying. And one day, death will come into judgment. And Father, I pray that you would call them to yourself. I pray that you would give them eyes to see, ears to hear. Give them a heart of faith. Grant them the gift of repentance that they might believe and trust and repent and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ to have life. Come to me that you might have life. Father, we thank you and we see the life of Christ all around us. I see it in brothers and sisters. I see it in your hand, handiwork. We are your workmanship. What makes us Christians? You do. We're your workmanship. And uh, we thank you, Father. And I, I pray, uh, Lord, that you would, uh, as, as your followers, for us, all of us, that you would even breathe refreshment into our lives, into our spiritual lives, into our physical lives. Reinvigorate our commitment to you, our love for you, our purpose in this world. Help us, Lord, to, like Harry Reader, like Tim Keller, like Boyce and Sproul and Spurgeons and, and Calvins and so many that have gone before us and Pauls and so forth. Uh, may we finish the work you've set before us and be found diligent, good, faithful servants. Help us to live out this life that we might stand before you grateful in the next. Um, Father, we just commit ourselves to you. We lay ourselves and our lives at your feet. And we pray for your grace to abound. 
And in particular, I also would pray for the life of this church. Keep us alive. Keep, us, keep, keep up the heart of this congregation pumping and breathing and doing and moving forward, advancing your kingdom and worshiping in glory and honor. And we just thank you for the gift you've given us and help us never to take for granted the gift of life. And we pray these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Would you join me as we stand together for God's benediction? As Israel's high priest blessed the people of God, now I bless you. And it is, again, a Trinitarian blessing. Here it is. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Amen.